All right. We'll continue to, to drop that in there. We love to see that. Um, we'll go ahead and get started since we are at one o'clock now, three o'clock here for me in Texas. Um, but I just wanted to take a second to welcome you all and to thank you because we know that everybody has busy days right now, especially in our, our current educational um, landscape. We all are we're scrambling and we're busy every day. So thank you for spending the time with us today. So welcome to the CASA UCLA CCEE Advancing Equity in an Era of Crisis webinar series. The California Association of African American Superintendents and Administra Administrators, CASA, and I, if you've never been to the conference, it's amazing. And the University of California, Los Angeles Center for the Transformation of Schools put this project together to support equity in virtual learning as we all shelter in place to, present, to prevent the spread of COVID-19. This work has been made possible by the generous support of the California Collaborative for Educational Excellence, known as CCEE. We are so grateful for their partnership on behalf of California's K-12 public school students. My name is Monica, and I'll be um, your host today on the back end, watching the chat and taking care of your needs there. I'm here to assist in any way. Um, so I will in a second mute myself and, and get to the back. But at the end of our session today, I'm going to ask you to complete a survey about today's session to evaluate our time together. Um, and for those of you who are watching this later on the recording, we would love for you to complete that survey as well. And as a matter of fact, what I'll do is, as um, we're getting started, I'll put the survey in the chat now, and then I'll also put it in the chat at the end of the session. So that will be there. And if you have a question that you want to ask, we ask that you use the chat feature and put your question there. At the end, we'll try to have time for questions to be answered. If by chance your question does not get answered, don't forget that you can go to extended session, look for Ken's picture for this session, and there will be a button there for follow-up questions that you can post there and still have your question answered. So that's super important for us to make sure that you have all of your educational needs met while you are here with us today. And with that, I will turn it over to Ken, who is an educational consultant and an expert, and he is about to take you through some very, very useful and valuable information. So thank you all for being here. Thank you for the nice introduction, Monica. First, I'd like to once again acknowledge our sponsors, the CASA, CCEE, and the UCLA Center for the Transformation of Schools. What I'm gonna do this afternoon is to give you a quick course, basically a semester course in about 45 minutes on child development, focusing on what are the kinds of things that parents and educators should know about how kids develop and what are the kinds of things that you can do at home to support that development. We say that knowledge is power and hopefully you'll leave today's webinar feeling more powerful and knowledgeable both as a parent and as an educator. We say that parents are their child's first teacher and that's true, but even more importantly, everyone who encounters a child becomes a teacher in some way or another. Confucius said, if your plan is for one year, plant rice. If your plan is for 10 years, plant trees. If your plan is for 100 years, educate children. And we believe that we should educate all children, but you can educate children if you don't know how they learn. So this afternoon, we're going to look at child development and strategies for learning focusing on answering several questions. First of which is how do, we, how do we create the conditions at home that support or enhance cognitive development? And what should parents and educators know about the developing human brain? Unfortunately, we leave the hospital with an infant and most adults don't know exactly what are the kinds of things they can do to help develop a child cognitively once they bring that child home. Another question is how does the brain, or does the brain remain the same as the child ages or does it physically change over time? And what can parents and educators do to nurture the development of every child, no matter who you are, whether you're a child care provider, a teacher, an ECE specialist, a parent, a school administrator, we're all responsible for the development of children. And this was best said by Lise Elliott, who said, the brain is without doubt our most fascinating organ. 
parents, educators, and society as a whole have a tremendous power to shape the Rainbow universe inside each child's head and with it the kind of person he or she will turn out to be. We owe it to our children to help them grow the best brains possible. <coughs> Pardon me. And this is why we say learning is actually a brain building process. And the components that you'll see throughout, nicely woven throughout the entire presentation today, the common threads are that the brain should be the centerpiece of all conversations about learning and development, and that learning is about making connections. Inside the brain, we have 100 billion neurons, and as those neurons connect, that's what fosters all learning. And active learning is one of the most enriching ways in which children can learn, but it requires that children be engaged, not sit and listen, but learning by doing. And their brain plasticity, and that's the brain is constantly learning, and as the brain learns, as the brain encounters new experiences throughout life, the brain continues to build new connections, which is what we call brain plasticity or neuroplasticity. But on the darker side, poverty and stress can also impact a child's development. And this also includes language. And we'll talk about what are the kinds of things that we can do to foster the development of language in children far better than we have in the past. And last, but certainly not least, is that the interactions and relationships that kids have are the important keys to healthy development for all children. Child development has been something that the U.S. has focused on for quite some time, but in the early 1900s and prior to the 1900s, all of 1700s and 1800s, the kids were constantly workers as well as adults. And Kids worked in fields, worked in mines. But then in the early 1900s, the U.S. noticed that German kids were far more successful in grade school and high school, and they asked the question, why? And Germans had something called kindergarten. And that was kinder, which means child, and garden, which means garden. And Frederick Foible coined the term the children's garden or kindergarten, and that was how is it that we should nurture children to better prepare them for the long years ahead in school. And that required that you give kids the daily attention that you would give to trees if you had an orchard or flowers if you had a garden. What are the kinds of things that you do every day to nurture their development? <clears throat> In child development, we say the first five years lay the foundation for all lifelong learning. And the brain is busily wiring itself for vision, for emotional stability, for language, motor skills, Everything that we do, every competency that we have is represented by wiring in the brain that makes that competency possible. And by the year, by age three, children have developed 80% of the basic wiring that sets the foundation for all learning. And by age five, 95% of that wiring has actually developed. We build on that wiring thereafter, but the foundation has already been established. We call learning changes, and it's neuroplasticity that make new connections and alter the brain physically. That's what we call learning, is the physical changes inside the brain that create new circuits. And interestingly, we're the only species on the entire planet that can create learning environments and plan learning events that determine how children learn, when children learn, if children learn, and how they physically grow and develop and if they thrive or not. But we are the architects of whether that occurs or not. We like to say that child development is the greatest show on earth. As I mentioned, it's a brain building process. And it's so important that we now refer to parents and educators, not as parents or educators, but as neuroplasticians. Because you're physically changing the architecture, the circuitry, the physiology of the brains with your child every time that child learns. We call learning the magic trees of the mind as circuits are built. And we say that children are naturally learning machines and their brains are what's called experience expectant. And that means that they're anxiously waiting for certain types of experiences to take place. And once they do, the brains develop because children were ready to learn. But in the absence of those experiences, the brain does not develop. The connections are not, are not made. 
and the whole process of brain development decelerates and it impacts the physiology of the child's brain and makes learning more difficult in the future. So we ask the question, how does the brain develop and what can we do to enhance early brain development? We typically identify five periods of child development, the prenatal period from conception to birth, infancy and toddler, toddlerhood from birth to age two, early childhood from age two to six, middle childhood from age six to 11, and adolescence from 11 to about 18. And adolescence is now being redefined as possibly up to the age 20. But first, the prenatal period of birth. The prenatal period immediately following birth. After about 18 days, the first formations of the brain begin to show. And by seven weeks, we begin to see definite constructions of what the brain is beginning to look like. At 11 weeks, we actually have a brain that begins to look like a human brain. And at birth, we have a fully developed child's brain uh, that should weigh somewhere between 300 and 33 grams to 350 grams. Some very interesting things occur during the process of fetal development and brain development. And one of the most important is that brain cells are being produced at the amazing rate of 250,000 every single minute. And to make certain that nothing interferes with that delicate brain building process, it's your job as hostess to expel any possible toxins. And that's why pregnant women are typically grumpy because pregnant women are often very nauseous. But that's the process by which they deliver a healthy baby nine months later. But prenatal environment requires that the proper nutrients and hormones flow through the placenta. And doing so is how a child first is delivered healthy, but be, remains healthy for the first 10 years of life. But a child or a fetus that's poorly nourished will experience low birth weight at birth. And the low birth weight changes almost every structure and function inside the brain but it also affects adult cardiovascular systems. Babies that weigh less than five pounds have a 50% greater chance of dying of heart disease or stroke because of the low birth, birth weight. And we know that over time, that impacts a person's ability to earn an income, perform educationally, and become a contributing member of society. But we see a consistent link between birth weight, heart disease, stroke, and diabetes, which is why we say there's nothing more important than making sure that a mother provides the appropriate nourishment for the developing fetus. But we, what we also find is that children born in, into poverty, they breathe contaminated air, they drink impure water, they're in areas where they're impacted by noise, maybe physically de deteriorated homes. Those are the kinds of factors that begin to interfere with fetal development. And as a result, those deficits are harder to overcome over time. We, there's something called the environmental cumulative deficit hypothesis. And that basically says that with the number of negative factors impacting a developing child, over time, they get worse and they become more difficult for a child to overcome them. Infancy and toddlerhood, and this is from birth until age two. When children are born, and they typically need about 39 weeks to be fully developed, and what we find is that at 33 weeks, there, there's a 10% chance that children will develop fully. At 36 weeks, there's a 90% child chance. It's because partially the, the brain is not fully wired. It's something called myelination that must take place during the last trimester. But we find that babies who are born early, they're also born with less fat and they experience hypothermia. They have trouble staying warm. 
At 11 weeks, the sense of smell goes online. 14 weeks, the sense of taste goes online. After 32 weeks, the body senses actually go online. The light, the eyes begin to detect light. The hearing actually goes online at about 26 weeks. And what's most interesting about that is that the fetus begins to hear the local language at 26 weeks before he or she is even born. They begin to hear the high frequency, high utility sounds by actually hearing the mother use, use language while the infant is still in utero. At birth, infants are given what's called the APGAR test or the APGAR scale. And that's checking the child for appearance, pulse, grimace, activity, and respiration. And they're checked at one and five minutes after birth. And this is one of the first ways to detect if there are any brain difficulties that might later lead to cognitive de deficits. Between infancy and toddlerhood, children are developing their motor skills, their vision, their, all of their senses, emotion, intellect, and the early language skills. Critically important to that development is the adult comfort and touch. And this, and children and infants make very little distinction between who is indeed a blood relative or not. If it's a child caregiver, an aunt, uncle, mom, or dad, or an older brother or sister, infants crave for stability and inter interaction. And when kids do not get that kind of interaction, they experience what's called failure, failure to thrive. And that is that all of the kinds of things that indicate growth and development begin to go in the opposite direction. The foundations for all of our competencies are actually set during the early years, and they require lots of interaction with our peers, but also interaction with adults as well. The newborn's brain typically weighs somewhere around 320 to 333 or 350 grams, but by age two, it is actually tripled in size. And during that time, what occurs is more connections are being built inside the brain. And you see that at six months and two years of age, the greatest number of connections have actually formed inside the brain. And this is primarily because this is the point at which children are now beginning to learn language. They're not necessarily speaking language, but their brains are primed to learn any of the 6,000 languages heard on the entire planet. And children learn to speak their local language. Thereafter, synaptic pruning begins, and that's when the brain actually begins to prune down unnecessary circuits that are not going to be used. Immediately after birth, one of the most important things that children need is lots of interactions. And children need to hear words, and they begin to replay those words in their heads, and it's talking to babies, face-to-face -face time, the eye contact, playing games like peekaboo, reading to a child, playing, touching, touching the toes, calling the names of the, of the fingers, things of that nature is how the brain gets turned on and comes alive. In early childhood from age two through six, the motor skills are developing, muscular control is developing, children are learning to walk, run, talk. They're de developing an understanding of the real world through play. We are growing concerned about the excessive use of technology because many children are watching technology and they're beginning to substitute the te technological word what they see on the screen for the real world. During this period, the brain is being built from bottom up, from the brain stem to the mid midbrain, to the limbic system, the emotional centers, to the cerebral cortex. And the cere cerebral cortex is where the highest forms of thinking actually take place. But it occurs, that development occurs bottom up, from restoration, heart, digestion, all the kinds of things kids do, which is eat and sleep, and the body runs itself and requires very little cognitive resources because it's run primarily by the brainstem. 
It's very important for educators and parents to understand that the brain of a child is not a miniature version of an adult brain. Instead, there are different parts of the brain that go online. As I mentioned, first, the sense of hearing goes online, then Wernicke's area for understanding sounds of language, vision, the senses, emotion, memory, motor skills, speaking, and last is behavioral control. And the region for behavioral control is in the executive center of the brain. And this is the part of the brain that takes somewhere between 19 to 25 years to actually mature. And this is why oftentimes we have high expectations of our children who are teenagers because we're expecting them to act like adults, but their brains are not adult brains at that particular moment. And this is why when we talk about developmentally appropriate, we're talking about brain development, not curriculum development, because there are different parts of the brain that go online at different times that foster and allow for different competencies to develop. Many of you have probably seen the major milestones for motor development in infants, being able to lift their head, support themselves, roll over, stand up, stand up with assistance. These are milestones and they're important milestones that all children will reach. What's important is that we reach those milestones. The specific time that a child reaches those milestones isn't as critically important as the fact that they reach them all and they do so in pretty much the order that you see. But parents get nervous when their child is, uh, say, 18 months of age and is not standing or walking yet. What we find is that children who walk early oftentimes fall quite frequently and get minor concussions, which later leads to language delays. So when someone says, my little Billy walked at only seven months of age, don't be impressed. Little, little Billy is probably going to have language problems as he develops and into school. The frontal lobes, as I mentioned, the frontal lobes take uh, approximately 20 years to actually mature. And this is partially why almost every car rental company will not allow you to rent a car until you're age 25 or older. And that's because judgment and decision-making actually reach their peak around age 25. Thereafter, we have that competency pretty well mastered. <coughs> What's most important for all parents to remember is that any neglect that a child experiences in early years cannot be overcome without concentrated effort. During the first five years of life, 90% of the growth and development type in terms of the brain actually occurs. It's during those years that we lay the most important foundations, as we mentioned before, and those foundations cannot be redeveloped once they have developed already. There is something though called neuroplasticity, and this is an article I wrote on neuroplasticity experience in your brain. And it's on the research behind how the brain is really not hardwired or fixed once you were born, but instead the brain is plastic enough to allow us to learn, change the brain, and take on new skills. Those of you who are 30 or 40 years old may recall there was a time when we didn't have cell phones. Our brain is constantly adapting to the environment, and this is what's called neuroplasticity. Some of you may have noticed that because we spend so much time writing on a keyboard that your handwriting is terrible. And it's a consequence of basically shifting some of the neural wiring from working with a pen and pencil and paper and now keyboarding instead. And consequently, we have trouble reading our own handwriting. What we say is that all brains can change but more importantly, all brains do change because they're designed to change, and that's how we learn. Neuroplasticity determines which brain cells connect and communicate with one another, which structures in the brain get linked to each other, which cells and which transmitters are actually going to be impacting one another, and the precise structure function correlations of the brain are determined by neuroplasticity. What's most important for our purposes 
as educators in particular, is understanding that between birth and 10, the ability to respond to new experiences changes. And what happens is it, be, it continues to decrease as we get older. And the hardwiring of the brain and the ability to change becomes more difficult. We've also often heard people say, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. The truth of the matter is that you can, but as you see with this graph, it simply gets more and more difficult and requires a greater effort over time. And one of those skills happens to be language. And what we find is that between birth and age four, we can learn almost any language with very little difficulty at all. But with the onset of puberty, the window for learning language begins to close and learning a new language becomes more difficult as we age, which is why we got a bill passed in California a few years ago to begin teaching foreign language in the elementary grades, not in high school. Language is one of the most important competencies that we develop during the early years. And children are born with the ability to learn any of the 6,000 languages spoken on earth. If I was born in Korea, I'd speak perfect Korean today. But be born in the US, I learned English. And as my brain got older, it began to prune down and prune away the ability to process the sounds of all of the other 5,999 languages. It's a child-directed speech that becomes critically important for parents and educators to know, and especially parents. There's something called CDS, or child-directed speech, and these are the short sentences with high-pitched, exaggerated expressions of the sounds. We call that parentese, where we say, see the ball, the ball went high, the ball bounced, the ball is red, I like that ball. It's called parentese. And parentese, or motherese, it was previously called motherese, but we now call it parentese, because both parents participate. Parentese is where we have the face-to-face -face conversations with infants and toddlers, and they hear those high-frequency, high-utility sounds with the exaggerated speech sounds. And it's the face-to-face -face prevalence of those sounds for the first 11 to 14 months of age that predict the number of words that a child will know by age two. And what children know by age two in terms of the number of words predicts the number of words they'll know before kindergarten. And that predicts the number of words they'll know by gr grade three, which impacts grade three reading scores. And grade three reading scores are a strong predictor of high school graduation. But this all begins in infancy. And the, unfortunately, schools are oftentimes assessed on how kids are mastering language when the foundation of this actually begins well before a child has entered kindergarten. Between one and a half years and two years of age, kids begin to combine two words in sentences called telegraphic speech, where a child won't say, daddy is outside, or I saw daddy go outside, he'll say, daddy outside, or Billy hit, or he'll make expressions like eat more, which means I'd like to eat more, I'm hungry, or more page, meaning, oh, can we read some more? But this is called telegraphic speech of children. But it's the language experiences, it's the singing, the talking, that help develop the neural connections inside the brain for processing language that are critically important. And it's those verbal interactions that determine how well a child is going to master language or if he or she will master language at all. And what we find is that there's a region of the brain called the parasylvian cortex connecting Wernicke's area and Brokaw's area. This is the arc of fasciculus that takes about 22 months to actually mature, at which time a child begins to speak his or her, his or her first sentences. But we find that the paras parasylvian cortex is as much as 30% smaller in children of poverty and children who grew up in areas where language has not been a dominant experience in their lives. When parents speak very little to children, as we see in the low responsive parents here in the blue line on the chart, what we find is that the number of words that kids are able to speak and read 
is diminished. But as kids hear parents using more and more language, their ability to process, understand, and use language increases dramatically in the first 20 years of life. Hartman recently conducted an, an exciting study for those of us in language development, where they found that by age four, children of professional families had heard approximately 45 million words used in the home. But children in working class families had only heard 26 million words, and children of welfare parents heard only 13 million words. And this is what is referred to as the 30 million word gap. And it's the quantity and quality of words that children hear that determine whether or not a child has a solid base for understanding language once they enter school. And kids who are in the lowest 25% in vocabulary development were also behind in third grade reading and in sixth grade reading, and they continue to struggle in school primarily because of the amount of language they heard at home. And unfortunately, the Arizona Department of Education is now projecting how many jail beds they'll need based on third grade reading scores, identifying how many kids are failing, and that number determines approximately how many kids are gonna be entering the prison system in the state. For children who lack that language support at home, there are things that we can do before they arrive at school or once they arrive at school. We say first give them something to do, and that's activating the 22 senses. We always talk about the five senses, the sense of touch, sight, hearing, and so forth. In neuroscience, we've been able to identify 22 senses, but using the primary senses, give children something to do, something to think about, something to talk about, something to draw or write about. And after they have experiences doing, talking, thinking, drawing, and writing, that's when we now give a child a chance to learn to read. But doing something as simple as asking a child, here are two apples, can you compare them? What's different about them? What's similar or what's the same? And what will occur if you bite into one of them? Having kids just talk and use language about a simple experience like that with, with an apple. And take that apple, have a child look at it, touch it, feel it, hold it, smell it, cut it, bite it and taste it, listen to it as you crunch it. When a child has those kinds of experiences, we can now use that experience to develop language. And these are some of the words that we developed as we had that experience working with educators in Alaska. And they said the apples were red, smooth, sweet, moist, rounded, pointy. And we developed all of these words that could be used to describe that experience with the apple. However, if you just had a picture of the apple, you would have to eliminate the sense of smell, the sense of hearing, the sense of touch, the sense of taste, and we would only use sight. The brain processes these events by using all of the senses. But if we eliminate those senses, we would also have to eliminate all of the words with the red X behind them. Limiting experiences limits language. We say words are used not just to speak, but words are used to think. And when you limit a child's ability to understand words, you limit, eliminate and limit their ability to think. If we just looked at the word apple, just the letters, and asked a child to memorize that word, they could do so, but they wouldn't make the kinds of connections that they would make if they had the experience and we had a discussion about all the features, characteristics, and attributes of an apple, as you see here. And this is why the multi-sensory experiences with children is one of the best ways in which we can develop language. When you develop a word wall for any word or experience, refer back to that word wall and show kids that many of the words that you'll see on that word wall also have they're what are known as polysemous words. They have multiple meanings and they have meaning outside of that one experience. And that's what develops academic language where kids can cont continue to transfer those words into other disciplines. And that's how kids are successful in school. <coughs> and to develop that literacy, 
We say reading to your child is important, what we call lap reading, where ch children actually sit on the lap of the adult. Reading with the, ch the child in small groups, having opportunities for kids to hear others read, hear others talk about what's being read, talk about the pictures. Reading by children, and that's what we call dear reading, and that's drop everything and read, and let children see you read. When children see adults read, that's when children recognize that reading has currency, reading has value, and they begin to model what they see in their adults. We always hear about the achievement gap, and what we find is that the achievement gap is actually a knowledge gap that's grounded in a vocabulary gap. Children come to school knowing to between 4,000 to 8,000 words, and by high school, the average child leaves high school knowing about 40,000 words. And that gives, a, gives us a 36,000 word difference. And for 13 grades, that means kids need to learn about 2,700 words per year, or 16 words per day. To get kids to learn 16 words per day, that means we need to give them lots of experiences, lots of opportunities to talk about words, talk about experiences, and begin learn using all the words they can to describe the experiences that they have. If we want to maximize that figure, we now are looking at learning 34 words per school day, which is quite a challenge, but it can be done through language experiences. But we say, Vocabulary is a proxy for knowledge, and the achievement gap is a knowledge gap that's grounded in a vocabulary gap. Drawing also makes a big difference for children, and I say that drawing does for the brain during the day what dreaming does for the brain at night. Giving kids opportunities to draw is one of the best ways to actually help them develop language while children are at home. Many of you have probably seen these figures and by adding a figure to the circle, we now have a what? A clown. And by adding more circles to the cone, we have the image of the ice cream cone. By adding more attributes to the rectangle, we can now produce a car. By giving kids attribute sets and creating figures with them, is one of the most important ways to help kids begin to understand how is it that we form language. Also, these are what are called basic figures or geons. And by giving kids these figures and having them trace them and draw with them is one of the best ways for kids to learn how to write. By looking at something as simple as stick figures, the face or the body is basically your letter A. Your letter B is composed of the same stick figures. The C is a full face or a half face. The letter D, the fingers are your E and F. The kinds of figures, the kinds of forms that we use to form letters are all seen in stick figures. Giving kids opportunities to draw is one of the best ways for kids to learn how to form their letters. And we can, in the stick figure, produce almost every letter of the alphabet except the letter S. And that's why kids have trouble with drawing the letter S. They typically draw the letter S backwards, but they do, do the same with B's, P's, D's, and Q's. And parents should never be too concerned about this until kids are in middle school or high school. But young children typically have trouble with these letter formations because they're basically the same letter, the orientation just continues to change. And as you see above here, I say a chair is still a chair no matter what position the chair is in, and the same with those letters. But this part explains why young children confuse those letters because they're basically the same formation, just different orientations. But child development, what's most important is that there's something called developmental neurobiology, and this is looking at the biological development of organisms given optimal conditions versus conditions that are deficient in some important ways. And just as we see plants not maximizing their potential, we see children 
not maximizing their potential, given the fact that sometimes they're in the wrong environment. Environments that are not conducive to their development. I have something that I call CHAMPS, and CHAMPS simply identifies the kinds of experiences that kids must have if we want them to develop their opportunities to learn. And CHAMPS is basically a C for common or shared experiences, H for hands-on learning experiences, applications as A, M is for making connections to prior learning, connecting what they already know to what they're about to learn, and P is the productive struggle. That simply says that the learning should be challenging, intriguing, and doable. And the last is sense-making. That's when kids say, aha, now I see, and they make a connection. And this means that all children need to have language experiences that are first experience-rich and then language-rich, where we have lots of interactions and we talk about what kids are learning, and then print-rich where we have examples where kids can actually see what they've learned in books. And it's that order that's critically important. Children should have firsthand concrete experiences first, then be able to visualize in the mind's eye a secondhand experience. And then the third hand experience is when we begin to introduce symbolic language. But too often, we begin over here with symbolic language and kids don't get it kids continue to struggle. But when kids make the connection from the concrete to the visual representation to the letters, kids say, aha, I understand. But too often we go the opposite direction or we stop with this symbol and kids continue to struggle because they don't know what that symbol actually represents. When kids have the aha moments that I mentioned, it's not just an aha moment. What happens is the brain physically makes a connection. And this is an example of a brain physically making a connection among neurons. And when neurons make that connection, that's when kids say, aha. And the brain literally rewards itself for making those connections. My middle son was born on the same day as his idol, Frederick Douglass. And Frederick Douglass said, it's easier to build so strong children than it is to repair broken men. And it's our job to prepare strong children. And that simply requires that we invest in children and childhood. And what we find is that by investing in preschool programs prior to school, the sooner we make that investment, the greater is the payoff. It decreases joblessness later, incarcerations later, it increases educational attainment later, increases personal income, increases the taxes paid by investing in the child early, not later when it's too late. There are some myths and facts about early brain development and you've all probably seen these that say things such as, to make babies smarter, you should buy baby Einstein products and try the Mozart effect and children start learning when they begin school and talking to a baby is not important because they cannot understand what you're saying until they're about four or five years of age and their brains are fully developed at birth. All of those are myths. And some of you probably bought the baby Einstein product and I'm one of the people who helped get the baby Einstein product taken off the mark market. There are about seven of us who got baby Einstein taken off the market because the product actually damaged early development. And what we found was that the more time a child spent with baby Einstein products, the more they were language delayed. So we asked, what are the takeaways from today's seminar or today's webinar? And why is early brain development important? And these are the takeaways that hopefully all of you have gathered by this point. And that is before age five, it takes time, intensity and repetition to develop the important brain circuits that we're going to build on later. And all learning depends on the brain circuits that have been built in the early stages of development. And what happens in early development affects how a child will develop later and well into adulthood. And the first 1,000 days of life, and that's what we call zero to three, have a profound 
impact on all brain development. And as we mentioned, the give and take, the serve and receive, the interaction with children, those early nurturing relationships are vital to all brain development and all child development. And that requires that kids have lots of opportunities to play, which decreases things like stress, which has a devastating impact on how their brain is going to develop. And the early interventions are critical in terms of changing the negative long-term effects of early deprivation. To optimize learning at home, I'll leave you with 10 recommendations. First of which is children need to feel safe and the brain prioritizes safety and well-being before anything else. If a child does not feel safe, he or she will not learn. If a child feels threatened, he feels endangered. And as the body brain says, as soon as I get into a safe place, then I'll learn. But right now, my safety is of paramount importance. Second, keep the learning environment free of clutter. If you have a child learning at home, try to provide a learning environment that is free of clutter and free of things that are going to be too distracting. The brain can process 4 billion bits of information per second and the brain constantly has to filter out anything that is distracting in order to focus and concentrate. And by minimizing clutter, you maximize the opportunities for a child to learn. Next, present information ways that challenge the learner to use multiple senses. As I mentioned, the 22 senses of the brain, the five primary senses, those are the means by which kids learn. By giving them opportunities to use visual models, that is pictures, illustrations, illustrations that they may draw, music, handheld tools like manipulatives, and then concrete examples. They set the stage for all later learning, but they begin by using the multiple senses. Next, keep lessons short. Physicians will tell you, and, people, and anyone involved with pediatric populations will tell you that six small meals a day are best for digestion, and we say that shorter and more frequent lessons enhance the digestion of content information. Kids need time not only to learn information, but they need downtime for them to process and think about what they have learned before new information is introduced. And too often we have large lessons with too much for kids to remember, and they don't make the connections and therefore they don't learn. But by giving them small bits very much like small bites, they can actually digest that information. Then nurture curiosity. Kids are born curious and they love finding out. They like asking questions. Those of you who have toddlers will notice how many questions they ask because they truly want to know. When you give kids items and let them explore them, ask questions about them, compare them, experiment, experiment with them, ask what if questions, that caters to their natural curiosity. And those are the kinds of ways when kids, the ways in which kids gravitate towards disciplines like science and STEM, which is something we want more of our kids to do. The sixth, tap into prior knowledge. What we say is that all learning is building bridges from what's known to new information. And if you want kids to get a head start on learning new concepts, have them link what they're about to learn with what they already know. Because the brain looks for patterns, the brain looks for connections. And the brain will always ask the child, how is this information similar or comparable to something that I already know? And we talk about the acquisition of knowledge. Neuroscientists will tell you that we don't acquire knowledge. Instead, we integrate knowledge with what we already know. And that's why we say with reading, the information goes not from the book to the brain of the child, the information goes from the brain to the book. And what a learner already knows determines how much he's going to comprehend any text. Number seven, provide time for practice. Dr. J. Cecil Park at Berkeley used to say, an important distinction has to be made between knowing something and knowing what it's good for. And when kids are introduced to a new concept or skill, give them opportunities to apply and practice that skill. And that's how they'll remember that information. And if they can connect it to a real life situation, all the better. And that means that, that they'll probably remember that information far better than ever before. 
Number eight, encourage kids to think about information in complex but developmentally appropriate ways. When kids feel cognitively challenged, they enjoy that kind of learning when they actually can apply, analyze, synthesize information, take it apart, put it back together, look at, it, look at the information in different ways. Those processes strengthen their ability to learn in the future. Number nine, teach to the whole child, that is present information to them in both visual form and verbal form. Don't just talk, but give them opportunities to see what you're talking about, help them make a connection. And discuss concepts logically, but also look at how is it that you see this intuitively? What are other ways to look at this same information? And then use activities and assessments that require reading, writing, and computing, but also creating and analyzing. And this is what we call catering to both the left and the right hemispheres of the brain. And last, make sure that kids are properly fed and hydrated, that's food and water, and that they have opportunities to move and exercise. Our brains do the best, their best learning when we have opportunities to move. But thirsty brains can't think, hungry brains can't focus on learning. They're more concerned about where and when am I going to get the next meal. And movement and exercise actually produce more oxygenated blood going to the brain, which helps to facilitate learning and memory. So let me end with this question. Based on what you've heard so far, can you take about one to two minutes to write down why is it important for adults, that's parents and children, and teachers to understand early brain development? So take about a minute and please write. And you can write your responses in the chat room if you like. And Monica can share a couple of those with us. I'm ready. <laughs> And be sure to comment to all panelists and attendees, and that way we can all see what you type. Thank you so much. This part two of our writing assignment is what was the most valuable idea that you learned this afternoon? And what will you do differently having had this conversation today? So again, continue to write. We say one of the most important ways in which we think is through writing. Because you can listen without thinking or remembering very much. You can read without recalling very much, but it's neurophysiologically impossible to write without thinking, which is why we end with our writing activity. And Dr. West and I can share some of those whenever you're ready for me to. I'm ready. Okay. So Desiree said to your first question, it is the teacher's role to be a major part of developing the mind of children. So knowing how it develops and the needs the brain has to accomplish this developmentally is critical for educators. Excellent. Yeah, the premise of my work is based on the question, if it's your job to develop the mind, shouldn't you know how the brain works? Mm -hmm. And Dana points out that learning is related to early brain development and requiring a student to do something beyond their brain's ability is frustrating. It's not only frustrating, it's what we call developmentally inappropriate. Absolutely. And we find that sometimes what we assign kids is not appropriate based on where the brain should be in terms of its development. And sometimes when kids have not had opportunity to learn in robust ways, they're going to be a little behind. And so what may be on grade level is still developmentally inappropriate for that particular child's personal development. Thank you for that. Lots of good comments here. Ophelia, it's important for adults to understand brain development because it allows us to be more, e to more effectively help them. And we have a point of reference for building those gaps that may exist. Excellent. Uh, let's see. I'll just jump down here towards the bottom. 
Um, Eddie says that he will be more cognizant and there are more comments that were put in there. And so, I, oh, there it is, of students' ability to use their prior knowledge to, uh, for new information. Um, Jody said that understanding development, developmentally appropriate is so important for us as educators. Tristan says it's helpful as an educator to know ways to support parents in our community um, and with their understanding of the early years and how the student's life is impacted in those early years and impacts their school. Yeah, absolutely. Nothing, nothing more important than educators sharing this information with parents. Because mm -hmm. parents sometimes are very frustrated because their, their child may not be learning as much or as quickly as the parent hoped. Absolutely. But every time that occurs, there's a neurological reason as to why. For sure. And I wanted to go back to, uh, to a question that you got earlier, or a couple of questions, Dr. Wesson. One is just a logistical question. People want to know if the slides will be available on the extended session site. Whether Absolutely. It's Absolutely. Okay, good deal, I thought so. And Carla wanted to know if you could speak quickly, I know we were short on time, to the impact of COVID trauma and stress on the brain and how we might start to think about how we as educators can, can deal with that type of trauma. Yeah, any stress on the brain is going to be detrimental to anyone's development. And the more children feel stress and even they can detect stress, you've all seen people or children will say, you know, Mrs. Washington doesn't like me. And you'll say, well, why? What does she say? Nothing. What does she do? Nothing. I can just tell. Children are very good at picking up stress and partic particularly picking up stress between their parents, which is why when parents have a fight at, school, at home, kids have difficulty learning the next day in school. Kids are impacted tremendously by stress. And with the staying at home, we need to find more ways in which we can make staying at home enjoyable for kids so they don't feel as though the COVID-19 is going to be a stressor on them in addition to the other stressors that the family may feel. On top of that, parents are now losing their jobs or having trouble paying their bills. We have additional stressors, which means finding more ways for both parents and kids to reduce the stress is very important. And one of the best ways we found was by just playing games together. Not, well, watching movies is good, but not computer games but games where we actually see one another's face. And those are the old board games. For sure. And then there was a question of, about the, the, the final 10 that you shared with us. Would you go back to number eight? People sure. want to see number eight again. All right, there it is. And that was Aisha, I think, who wanted to see number eight. And also just a reminder that might have been because we didn't know if the slides would be available, but now Aisha, you know that you can go to extendedsession.com and I put the website in there for you all that you can find the session again. And again, if you're watching this recording later, don't forget that we also would love to have your feedback in the survey. I'm going to drop the survey link in here again for those who came in late. I dropped it in here earlier, but there is the survey link again. And Dr. Wesson, I wanted to just let you know, I know you were presenting and didn't necessarily see the things that people were saying, but you got rave reviews and people are so appreciative. So just on thank behalf you. of everyone who's here, I'll give you the ceremonial bow. Um, and thank, <laughs> thank you. you. Very much. <laughs> but well, thank you all. Oh, and I'll see if there's, is there anything else in the chat that anyone wants to drop before we go? There's still some good comments coming in. Everyone is thanking you for this very valuable information. And there was a point uh, that a few people made around the fact that while we're talking about child development and brain development in the early years, that people who are primarily supporting educators, I mean, ed students in the secondary sector, this is super important for us as well. So we wanted to thank you. Um, yeah. Carla says, do you think you'll do a presentation for adolescents and early adulthood at some point? <laughs> oh, we, we definitely can. But okay. let, let me end with my last slide. And it's basically, it basically says, our children come in a variety of colors, but all brains are basically gray. And it's only the gray matter that truly matters when it comes to learning and memory. And it's our job as parents and educators to maximize the amount of knowledge that we have on the developing brain and that will help our children both at home and at school. And with that, thank you very much. Thank you all so very much. Um, and to Eddie's question about accessing the slides, um, if you 
are in the actual extended session on the page, what you'll do is if you don't, let me double check this, I'm hopping on here. So if you don't have an account, go ahead and put your email address and name in there. It'll take you to all the sessions and the recording. This one might not be in there yet. I'm not quite sure, but normally what happens is after the session is over, we have to get the recording from Zoom and then it will go there along with the resources that are attached to the to this session. So you may not see it today, but if you give it a little bit of time, it'll definitely be there. 24 hours, I just saw it. <laughs> 24 hours, it'll be there. Thank you all so very much. And thank you for your help, Monica. You're welcome. It was fun. I learned a lot. My little sister has a PhD in this and she would have okay. been she would have loved to be here today. <laughs> oh. Thank you, Laurel. Shout out to Laurel for pointing out to me that some people's comments weren't coming through the chat. I appreciate it. It's my verbal shout out to her. All right. Thank you all. Be well and stay safe.